Are rats out? Uh, this is lesson number two of my program, uh, lesson 002. Today we're going to build on a few of the things that we covered in lesson one. In this case, uh, preparing an opening and how much work is necessary and how much isn't. All right, this particular game was played uh, in the 1980s in a U.S. Open, and I was paired against a FIDE master. Uh, let's just take a look at the first few moves and we'll see where it goes. Okay, d4, knight, f6. Okay, black could go into a Gruenfeld type position, but he just prefers to defend with the king's Indian defense. And it continues on that way. Okay. So far, all book. No great surprises here. And uh, here, I'll explain why I chose my 10th move. Uh, I didn't really prepare much at all for this game or for this opening. Uh, sometime recently, within a year or two of this game, I had studied a little bit of a book called Playing the King's Indian Defense. I believe it was written or co-authored by Leonard Barden. Uh, played over about four or five games from this kind of setup and quite usually won. Uh, but uh, I was c considering adopting it as black and I did use it a time or two. And just a few months or weeks prior to this game I had the black position and somebody played this line as white against me and, and I went on to win with black. So I decided, uh, well, why prepare? Uh, I'll just play what white did, but I'll know what to, to do and what not to do. Okay, so he continues with f5. Now, actually, I found out later this isn't uh, white's best setup. Uh, can't go into the analysis of that. It's beyond the scope of this. But that doesn't mean that black's going to win or white's going to lose as a result of this opening. It's just that uh, white probably had better. And we'll talk about that later. And you'll see. Okay, so now uh, the basis of the King's Indian defense is set in motion. Uh, let's, if you're not familiar with this, let's just take a look at uh, the, the white pawn structure compared to the black pawn structure there in the center. Those pawns are blocked, locked, they're not going anywhere, at least for now. So what you have is you have a type of middle game that's going to develop. Uh, white has three open files that he would like to uh, create play on, and black has two open files that he would like to create play on. And the game is considered even, even though white has an extra file to work with. And I suppose the best answer as to why the position is even is because at the end of the line of black's two, in, uh, two open files, or the files he wants to open up, lies the, the enemy king. So uh, theory consider, considers this position about even. And it's up to both sides to continue their plan and see who gets there first. Okay. And black continues as he should, advancing his pawns, and I do the same. And, and now the game uh, takes kind of a strange turn. Uh, I had a, a video commentary for the Team 45-45 leg league in a game between uh, Big H and Just Insane. Uh, where the Queen's Gambit declined exchange variation came up and what happened was uh, Black didn't play the middle game as uh, he was essentially ex uh, supposed to. He came up with a whole new plan and White had to uh, met methodically refute that plan. And surprisingly what happens here is uh, Black uh, immediately abandons all at attempts to attack on the King's side. Instead he focuses on 
uh, preventative maintenance on the queen side. Now, I don't know why he chose this path. Uh, I don't know. It could be a number of reasons. Maybe he didn't know the middle game. Maybe he had lost badly on the queen side and felt that he could play uh, safe against me and later bring the king side attack into play. I, I don't know. Uh, but th essentially, that's what he what he did. And let's just stop and ev evaluate a couple other things about this type of position. Uh, strong pieces and bad pieces. Okay, look look at the four bishops for a moment. I circled them. The uh, dark squared bishop is white's better piece because it has a lot of scope. Uh, that's one of the reasons this line is played. It's and it's dropped back to f2 because it uh, points down that uh, queen side. But the black counterpart is pretty bad. It's shut in behind its pawns. It's, it, in a way, it's kind of like the uh, French bishop. It, it never gets out. Conversely, the light squared bishop is white's uh, bad minor piece, and the black uh, white light squared bishop is his strong piece. And, and you can see why. A lot of reasons. The, the, the white pawns are in the center are all on uh, white squares blocking that bishop. Uh, whereas the black piece, the black light squared bishop has a lot of activity. Now, granted, it can't go to some of those squares, but it it those will open up eventually, and it may even be sacrificed when some lines open up. Uh, so, if you're going to trade bishops in here, you know which one you want to trade, depending on what side you are. Although it's awful hard to see how black is going to trade that dark squared bishop off. And I guess from the same context, it's hard to see how white's going to trade the uh, light squared bishops off. So the game stays dynamically even. Uh, also, just another thought uh, about the bishop on f2. I pointed out some of the things it does. It also can get in the way. If that g file opens up, there may be a lot of pressure on uh, g7. And white may have to be defending that square. And, and a rook or a queen on the second rank uh, wouldn't defend g2 because that bishop is in the way. Um, so just a thought. Okay, let's move on. And as I said, black kind of abandons his strategy of attacking on the king side and settles for securing the queen side. Okay, so he drops his knight back into e8. Uh, what it does there is it, well, first off, it's not supporting the g4 thrust anymore, but it kind of battens down the hatches and supports uh, both c7 and d6. But it was kind of passive, so logically what I have to do is continue what I'm doing on the, uh, on the queen side. Okay, so I play knight b5. Uh, his, now, perhaps he's afraid of some kind of tactic where maybe I take on d6 and, and gobble that pawn on a7 because I have uh, a couple of uh, men on it. So that kind of explains his next move. But his next move is also a, a weakening move. He plays uh, b6 and this just kind of gives me a couple holes that I didn't have before. I've got the c6 square. Can't occupy it yet, but my my pawn watches it. Uh, I've got potential on the a6 square. If, if black's idea is to bring the bishop out to a6 and take on b5, well, sure, I'll welcome that because I get rid of my... Uh, well, I don't really want to get rid of a knight, but I get rid of his best uh, minor piece. So let's see what black hat in mind, and I, I continue on. Uh, I develop with queen c2 here. It's, it's a logical move. Got to get the, the pieces out. Uh, we both have some pieces stuck on the back rank. Uh, he still has some pieces on the queen side that haven't even moved. His queen, uh, rook, and bishop are all sitting there on their original squares. So I have maybe a slight lead in development, probably a slightly better position here, especially since he's taken a step backward and not uh, started conducting his kingside attack. Okay, so now he plays bishop d7. And again, I, I don't mind at all if he, if he trades that. Now, a lot of people might look at this and say, well, what about c6? Uh, it looks like a natural move, and probably there's nothing wrong with it. I 
this is played so long ago I don't remember why I rejected it but it's going to be a question asked so let's see what's what's good or bad about it okay well first off it does the obvious thing it just it sends the bishop back to c8 but uh, at the same time it further locks up the position now we have uh, uh, two pawn chains and the line of communication between kingside and queenside is even uh, smaller here everything goes through c8 on the black side uh, so black black may be okay here especially if he somehow managed to lock up uh, all the queen side then it becomes uh, a, a game over on the king side so I really don't have any targets here I've got some space but how am I gonna do it I'm gonna have to open up a file at some point I'll have to push a4 and a5 and again what if I when I'm doing that he he managed to lock up the pawns then I'm probably gonna have to sacrifice a piece for a couple pawns uh, so that my queenside pawns can roll in so it may not be a bad choice to to push c6 but it just seems to limit so many of my options uh, I want open lines on the queen side, okay? So let's let's back up, and I'll show you what I did. I I just went ahead and helped support the knight in on uh, b5, even though it's guarded. Okay. Now he he kicks it, wants to send it out of there. And I have a little wish and zug. I say, okay, if you take my my knight, I'll take yours, and uh, that's what he did. Uh, and I just today earlier looking at this found out that I can get away with uh, uh, pawn takes on c7 and and play a piece down for a few moves and have a fine game. I didn't consider it really at the time. Call that a thinking deficiency of my own. Uh, but again, there's nothing wrong with the the move I played. It preserves all the advantages that I've uh, built up already. Okay, so now uh, there's a tempo on the queen. He's he's got to deal with that. And now we're going to retake on b5. Do you know which way to take? Think about it. I've kind of given the answer already. Okay, pause it if you want to think about it. Okay, we're resuming. And then there's the answer. As I said earlier, we want to trade off the, the light squared bishop. So it would be kind of foolish to f further entomb my, my bishop behind, uh, behind those pawns and take with the a pawn. So, go ahead. Uh, now, if, if he wants to trade bishops, that's fine with me. I don't mind the double pawn. I don't mind it at all. And that's what he does. Uh, now, a question. Can, can black get away with playing uh, queen takes b4? Let's, let's take a moment and consider that. What happens if he does? Well, I've got... Uh, got some activity here if he plays queen takes b4 I get an immediate tempo on it on his rook now he can bring it into play on the uh, down on the seventh rank let's see what happens here okay rooks it just seems like a logical move okay I've got a check on e6 if I want it uh, I can uh, play my knight to d3 and be attacking his queen, followed by uh, queen takes, uh, or rather queen take queen e6 check and knight takes e5. Looks like I've got got some chances here. He's infested the queen side now, but his king side is kind of weak. So let's just see. Knight, knight d3. Where is he going to put the queen? Well, he might have to come back to uh, to d6. So just to gain his pawn back, he's still left with uh, kind of a kind of a bad position here. If I trade the queen on d6, he's got immediate problems. If he takes with the pawn, the uh, b6 pawn falls, and if he takes with the knight, the c7 pawn falls. So Black's just going to have to play a pawn down and not capture on, on b4 at the moment. 
Okay. So he plays uh, rook f6. Clearly that idea is partly to keep my queen out of c6. And it, you'll see his other intent here in a moment. So I go ahead and bring the knight into play, which connects my rooks. And now he indicates he's finally considering getting his g4 move in. So uh, I've got to show that I've got enough going here to justify uh, him having to stop and cover cover his uh, position because it's it's kind of weak on the queen side. So I played uh, queen b2. Now perhaps if there was a better move to play, queen queen b3 would eventually transpose. The advantage of queen b3 is in some lines there's a discovered check. So I've talked about making minor mistakes. Uh, this could be a second one. I didn't take on c7 was one opportunity, and, and I didn't play queen b3. Um, but it, nothing wrong at all with queen b2. It does also keep some pressure on, on e5, so there, there's really nothing wrong with it. It's kind of a matter of choice. Okay, now he plays uh, knight d6, and he's eyeballing getting his pawn back. But it's my turn, and I just need to keep up doing what I was doing. And I stick the, the rook on c6, which says uh, pin, pin that knight. He can't move because he'll drop a rook. So he breaks the pin, and his bishop really had uh, no no future on uh, g7. Here on f6, it's a one step closer into getting into play later. It might might help him out. Okay, so now just follow through with logical moves. Double the rooks on the open file. Uh, attack a pawn. Stay a pawn ahead. Okay, rook a7. Okay, that's okay. It, the rook is defending. At the same time, it's also uh, staying on the the open file. But it's up to me to prove I I have something here. And I go ahead and triple my uh, heavy artillery on the open file. Now, what's he going to do here? He could maybe drop his rook back to g7. Maybe play his knight back to e8. But certainly, the white position is fine here. I'll I'll find a move. Instead, he goes ahead and takes his takes his pawn back, and now I have a a little uh, semi combination here to, to to trade some pieces off. Uh, D6, and I had mentioned this idea earlier. It's going to undermine something in his position. He just can't help it, so he goes ahead and takes it. Now he's a pawn up just for a moment, but I get it right back. And as I said, there was going to be an exchange of pieces here. And, and he comes up with uh, an interesting uh, defense here. Uh, also, I'd, I'd like to mention we're getting closer to an end game. And right now, this end game favors uh, white in every respect. White has the better rook. Uh, white has the better knight and white has the better bishop. Uh, nothing nothing at all wrong with uh, white's uh, position here. So in, in order to win, eventually we're gonna, going to train, trade some more pieces down and just about every end game favors white. Just considering the minor piece endings, uh, bishop versus bishop will favor white, bishop versus knight will favor white, knight versus bishop will favor white, probably even knight versus knight would favor white simply because uh, the black pawn on e5 is a little weak. Uh, and then with a rook still on the board with either one of those pieces, that's going to favor white. So. White doesn't have to specifically focus on any particular end game. Anyone that arises that's in his favor, he'll make an exchange and and uh, and win this easily. So White has to be a little careful here. There's some there's some pitfalls here to avoid. If Bishop takes uh, b6 immediately, uh, Black gets this little counter move in, uh, attacking the rook and working on that bishop on b6. So white's got to be be just a little bit careful here. So 
I eliminate the uh, that possibility and he goes goes ahead and does it again now, now I've shown this game uh, in lessons various times and one one move keeps being suggested by by spectators so why don't you take a look at this and see if you can see a possible move by by white go ahead and pause the video okay uh, a lot of people that have seen this as I said have suggested uh, rook takes uh, on f7 here it's a fairly simple combination to see clearly if king takes rook knight takes e5 check and then take uh, the rook and white's a pawn up in a bishop and pawn ending and going to win it but but uh, there's kind of a problem here it's black has his wishing zug he doesn't have to be so so helpful here okay rook d6 uh, attacks the knight so the knight comes in and on e5 and suddenly there's this check and the only way to get out of check is to give up the bishop and what's happened here it's true whites won a pawn and whites probably okay but look at that uh, black rook it was very passive before now suddenly it's very active uh, white should still be winning this but this could get very complicated. We've we could say we've made one of those minor mistakes, and that's thus allowed the stronger player to get back in the game. And we don't want to keep giving a player we have down chances to come back. When he's down, we want to keep him down. So this is an awful lot to analyze all of a sudden to to prove that that White could win this. Do we really want that? We, uh, what's black going to do? Well, he's got all kinds of possibilities. He can put the rook on on b1. That threatens uh, to take the pawn immediately. Uh, also, it starts threatening a series of nuisance checks. Uh, and if white just keeps going back and forth, black will do the same and shake my hand and say thanks for the draw. <laughs> so, sometimes you don't want to be greedy. You want to stop and think a little bit. And even though, I, like I say, I won a pawn, and white will probably still win this with accurate play, we've given black a second wind. So let me just show you the nice move that's just as good. It's king, F, king f1. And black shows what his intent was. His intent was to play rook d6. And then I just play king e2, and his rook is no longer going to enter, enter into my position. If you really look at it, where can it go on the d-file? It can't really go anywhere, uh, even if the knight's gone. Uh, it can't go to d5, it can't go to d4, and then my king covers d3, d2, and d1, and my rook covers uh, d7, and his bishop's in the way. So he's got his rook on the open file, and all it's doing is keeping my king on the uh, king side. But it, I don't need it there. I've got, I, I mean, I, I, it's fine there. I'm doing other things to him that he's got to worry about. So uh, he decides to activate his king, and like I say, it's my turn. I've got ideas here. So I play b5. b5 uh, opens up uh, the b4 square so my knight can get into play and to get into better squares from b4 it's eyeballing both c6 and d5 it's doing fine where it's at now it's tying his knight down to that pawn but we've got to trade one advantage in for another get rid of the threat on that pawn and get the knight to a better square okay so king e8 and now knight b4 now his knight's free but where does it go his knight doesn't really have any any active squares if it goes to h6 it, it still has no squares then back to g8 then maybe by way of e7 or or f6 it'll find something if it goes back to h8 instead it can come into g6 and where does it go from there h4 maybe i might just take it off so Black decides, uh, well, I'll trade a rook here, but I don't want any part of that. Um, I, I have the better rook, so I'll just keep it, and I'll go and pin pin your bishop. Now I'm threatening to take on b6, so Black has to deal with that. He breaks the pin, but I, it, it's just too late. I've got I've got activity now, and it's going to fall. So now I've got the pawn with check. And he wants to trade rooks again, and I don't. 
I'm happy with my rook. It's helping my pawn promote. And now I go ahead and put the bishop in on a good square. And he attacks it. And I just stop and check him. And I say, go ahead and have my bishop. And he does. But the drawback is he's going to lose the rook. And now white's up an exchange or a quality if you're European. And has a, a routine win. And here finally at move 47 comes the move that he should have played about 30 moves ago. But the drawback is he's down material and he's got no material to attack my king. But at least he played it. He finally got it in. And I found an inter interesting move here. If he takes or uh, pushes by, his king can't come into the uh, king side. And his knight's going to have fun trying to work its way in there to attack me. So he took a, in passant, and I retook. And now I want to play h4, further uh, locking him in. So he doesn't uh, want to allow me that. And I just play... Uh, rook g8 and black decides that, that this game is lost uh, there's really nothing he can do if he if he plays knight g5 I can I can just take it and I reach a uh, a winning combo, uh king and pawn ending because I'm going to attack e, e6 and he can't stop me I'll just show you if you're not sure okay he can't stop me from getting into d5 no matter what he plays and then e5 falls and f4 falls and uh, that's game so after the game was over he congratulated me and and my rating was down to low 2100s at the time it was going back up and he said to me you're not 2100 and I thanked him I said well I've been over 22 and it's it's gonna go back up uh, but game set and match to the white pieces here and I have uh, something else I'd like to show. We have one more game. One moment. And I'll get it loaded up. What is it doing here? Here, I'll just do this with it. Okay, this is, uh, I labeled this against Strong Master. This player is could be a feeding master by now. Uh, I don't really know. I've lost touch with him. Very, very strong player. Uh, definitely better than I am. I would say we played a number of times, and I, I would guess out of every four games we played, he won two, uh, I won one, and, and the other one would be a draw. Uh, this was one that I was able to uh, to win, and you'll like this game. This relates directly to the game we just saw and is a net result of my opening preparation. Uh, you'll see how I took this previous game and applied it here. And I didn't really do all that much. Okay, so we go through uh, the same opening as we've seen before. And now a new move. In the other position, I was playing 10 bishop e3. Uh, but I did some research, and I found out this is the better move to play knight d3. And then on f5, uh, I'll notice if bishop e3 now, it just gets kicked out of there. So uh, I could play f3, I suppose, but he might play f4. And I'm not going to get that bishop to f2 like, like I did in the other game. But that's not the idea. You don't want that bishop on on the uh, G1H7 or G1A7 diagonal. And here's the move. Bishop D2. Okay. 
the, here's the difference. If black goes about his way and pushes f4, that's that's considered a horrible mistake. Uh, and you say why? Well, I'll, well, I'll give you a little quiz. What do you think? Uh, I kind of gave it away in the previous game, so there's a hint in case you need it. Go ahead and pause the video, and we'll come back. Okay, did did you find it? Uh, White pretty much has a clear advantage here, according to theory, if he plays simply bishop g4. And black can scream bloody murder here, but eventually he's going to have to trade off the, uh, the light-squared bishops, and that was his best piece. So that that's the wrinkle in the armor, uh, or the chink in the armor, or whatever you want to call it, that uh, Black can't just go about shoving his, his pawns as easily. And I don't remember all the theory uh, for what I prepared, because again, this game was close to 30 years ago. But he played a move, and, I, and as far as I recall, and I have a pretty good memory, he told me this was uh, Fisher's move. So if Fisher played it, it's probably good. Uh, and I don't remember what I analyzed, if I'd even prepared for that, but I had to make a choice now. It's my move. What am I going to do? I'm out of my book. He didn't uh, bite with f4, allowing me bishop g4. So uh, I've got to uh, make, a, make a plan here. And I'll try to recall my thought process the best I can. All right, in the previous game, we saw that black should have started his kingside attack. And I guess it's to be expected that black's going to do that here. It, it, but the difference is now some of some different parts of the queen side are locked up. I no longer have three open files to play with as I did in the other one. I have two two that I can open up uh, because he's, he's locked the center. I have to prepare for b4 and then make an exchange and maybe he'll play b6 and I'll get this open b file to work with and maybe that's it. And probably nothing wrong with that plan uh, but it's a matter of choice and, and what do I feel like uh, playing here. Uh, so since I didn't wouldn't, wouldn't really have the active type uh, game that I did in the other in the other encounter uh, I decided that what I would do is is play a little different. Just a second. I'll play a little different and and just go ahead and open up the center. And I took en passant on c6. And nothing wrong with this choice. But now the game takes on some different dynamics that the that the other one didn't. Uh, no longer is the whole center locked up. I still have possibilities to activate my pawns on the uh, on the queen side. I can prepare for b4, a4, b5. Uh, at the same time, black can, at a timely moment, might be able to free his game with uh, d5. We don't know until we get there. But since the position is slightly open now, uh, it's going to take on an entirely different uh, t character than the previous one did. So. All I can do now is uh, do what I should do is continue my development. And I played f3 here, which just bolsters down the uh, the king side. I admit that he's not going to push by with f4 and let me get bishop g4 in. Okay, so black takes a moment and plays uh, king h8 to just get it out of the way. It might not have been a bad move for me to have played king h1 last move. Um, it, I could still do it. it. It will cost a tempo. There's some possibilities that the king could be a little uh, loose on g1, and I'll show you when we get there. Uh, but instead, I just continue with my development. And now if you look at this position, there's a lot to be said about uh, white slight material. I mean, sorry, white slight development advantage. Okay, the kings kings are pretty much the same on both sides. The rooks are exact match. Uh, my knights are on the third rank. His knights are on the second rank. So I got a tiny edge with my knights. Both my bishops are developed. They're not developed very well, 
Uh, matter of fact, I can't really go do much here, but neither can his bishops, and one of his is still on its original square. So uh, I've got a slight lead in development here and a very slight advantage. In other words, the advantage of the first move and maybe just a little bit more, maybe a quarter of a pawn, I don't know. But white's okay here, uh, and black goes ahead and calculates that he can open up the uh, the center safely. But actually, this was uh, kind of starts his downfall, although he still had some chances, as we'll see. Uh, he, since he's down a couple tempos in development, he really shouldn't be opening up the, the game, because when the lines open up, the, the player that has the better developed pieces is going to be the one that seizes those squares and those open lines. So, and once you have better squares for your pieces, more opportunities uh, to attack and or put pressure will arise. So, uh, maybe he could have played uh, bishop b7 or maybe knight b6, anything but, but d5. So this gives me some chances. And as you'll see, I don't really uh, make any spectacular moves over the next series. I just plan everything out carefully and make natural moves, and, and, and soon we'll have a, uh, a winning game. Okay. So I follow up. Well, I'll go ahead and, and take. Now this opens up the C file, and I, I'm already on it. He's not. And uh, now, question: I want to since I want to take on d5. Which way to take? Uh, if I take with the knight, I force him to go ahead and take, or or he'll admit that uh, he's just given up a pawn for nothing. If I take with the pawn, he doesn't. He he can take his time, uh, re-coordinating his men and take that pawn at his leisure. And besides, I want to take with the knight because it opens up the c file, and suddenly I've, I've got a little better activity and more squares for my pieces, especially particularly the queen. Okay, so he uh, takes my knight, and now knight b6, and the pawn on d5 is a goner, but look what's happened. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, there's plenty of open squares and open lines on the, on the queen side, and any notion of black attacking on the king side has kind of vanished. You don't see that thematic uh, pa pawn storm with pawn to f4 and g5 and h5 and g4. Black is not even prepared for that. Uh, plus, he's not even all that developed. Yet, there's a whole uh, bunch of squares open on the queen side that I can occupy. So, in reality, this game kind of looks like the other one. Uh, black had, an, had attacking chances on the king's side, but didn't try them. Here, black can't try them because he has, doesn't have them. But in the other game, I also had plenty of activity on the queen's side, and, and here I have it too. So, it's, it's, a, it's kind of, a like I said, a way of finding uh, the best moves here, and and I'll explain my thought process as, as, as I recall it. Naturally, uh, white wants to uh, get his rooks into play as quickly as possible, but think about it. Uh, this is what I thought. I says, well, I'm re not really sure where I want my rooks yet. Uh, my minor pieces need to have some better squares first. If I if I advance them up the board a little bit, I'll open up uh, various files that that those rooks can occupy. So. It's just as a general rule in the opening when you're playing your first moves, you bring out your minor pieces first, then you bring out your rooks. Well, we're kind of following the same idea here. We're just taking it to a second level. That We've got the minor pieces out, but let's get them a little better uh, placed before we bring the rooks. Okay, so I play knight c5. It looks like a perfectly uh, strong square for the knight to occupy. It, in, it uh, influences the... Uh, several squares in the enemy camp. It puts the heat on uh, on the squares I've, out, I've circled. If black wants to put his bishop on any of those, I may just take it off uh, and enjoy the, the advantage of the bishop pair. Or I may just keep my knight on c5 because it's so potent and continue uh, finding squares for the rest of my pieces. So knight c5 is a nice move. Uh, I ha still don't, don't ha 
don't have my works committed, but we'll get there. Okay. And Black goes ahead and recaptures the pawn and re restores material equality. And now I want to uh, uh, improve my minor pieces a little further still before I put my rooks out. So in the last game, the bishop, the light squared, the light squared bishop wasn't a very uh, active piece. Here I'm finding ways for it to get active. Uh, now I'm on the a2, a, uh, g8 diagonal. So that's that's good. I'm tying his queen get down to guarding that knight on uh, on d5. And he had he had some possibilities here, some tricks along uh, along the lines of finally getting the 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 queen into b4 or d4 with check. For instance, uh, it might have been I'm trying to remember this. I was looking at some ideas where he gets a5 in so he can put the knight on b4. And if I'm not careful, there's this queen check, which uh, picks up might pick up one of these minor pieces. Uh, but he didn't see that. He just went about his business and uh, redeployed the knight. Here he's trying to release the pressure of this knight c5. He recognizes that it's a, a great square for the knight. And... He, he would like to trade knight for knight, so he's preparing that. But still, if you look at the game, I, I'm still two tempos up. My uh, queen and and bishop have, have moved, and his queen and bishop haven't. And my rooks are connected, his aren't. So I still have uh, a minor lead in development. And so I just go ahead and uh, continue improving the position of my minor pieces. Okay, bishop a3 is a perfectly logical move. It takes away uh, the queen d4 check motifs. It uh, opens up the d file. I'm, I'm, I want to put a rook there with tempo. Uh, so bishop e3 is a nice useful move that does a lot of things. And suddenly uh, black's got a little uh, problem here. The, the position is opening up and he's still behind in development. So he, he develops his queen to try to catch up. Uh, now there's a lot of possible rook moves here, and if if whenever we uh, move a rook, we always question ourselves. Maybe uh, was that the right rook to put on that square? Well, I played. I'll show you what I played, then we'll talk about it. I played rook f d d one. Now the alternative is, what about the other rook? Well, if I do that, I've taken away the rook c1 idea, which may or may not be useful. And and, and I've pretty much limited myself to either doubling on the d file or uh, putting the rook on e1. Now, naturally, I could, I could play rook e1, and there's a cheap threat, but uh, bishop takes f4, but he's going to see that and not allow it. Uh, but I think the right rook, uh, was the uh, f rook to go to d1, and I can still swing the uh, the other rook over to c1, and then Black goes about trying to free his position up a little bit. But unfortunately, this this allows a little tactic that's going to cost him material. Uh, if you'd like to try to solve it, uh, white play, see if you can find it. Uh, I okay, go ahead and pause if you if you've resumed here's here's the move okay bishop d5 which gains a tempo on the rook it also helps support the c5 square uh, and you'll see here in a moment rook goes to b8 and then I make the exchange that he wanted but now there's there's a little trick here and he's going to uh, regret it his queen is tied down to guarding the bishop and when it moves, the rook on f8 is loose. So I'm winning the exchange or the quality. And now I just make some exchanges. And white's, white's winning. And it's just a matter now of uh, securing the point. And I'll show you the remaining moves. Okay, b3. Uh, the purpose of b3 is that it frees my rook for moving and I don't have to sit and worry about dropping the a pawn. I can afford to play this slow and 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 convert the point 
easily enough. He attacks my queen. Well, fine. I'll just double on the open file and he can't do a thing about it. And he, he goes ahead and checks. And it's safer course. Which way? F1 or H1? Uh, probably uh, probably uh, H1. Uh, who wants to have to look at the nightmares? Queen, queen uh, A6 check. And I'm forced to make moves like maybe king f1 eh, or king e1. Well, I guess I have queen e2. But it's just much safer to park the king in the corner because he's not getting at me. I just have to make sure I don't leave my back rank unattended a little later. So he blocks the d file, attacks the rook. And that's fine. I'll offer an exchange. He can't accept. And. You know, the more exchanges he makes, the, the attrition factor will get him. So I just put the rook down on the seventh rank, and uh, he opens up some some lines for his queen. Although it's not really threatening anything, but what else does does Black do here? He's got a lost game, and I just take the pawn because he can't retake because of a pin, and so he's left with just uh, shoving his pawns, and I attack the uh, the rook. And I'll say, you want to trade rooks? And he, he can't. But I find ways to keep offering him exchanges as he's getting his kingside attack going. And then here I offer to trade queens. And he, he, he can't do that. And then I offer to trade queens again. And he's pretty much forced to now because uh, if his queen runs away, he gets mated or drops the rook with check. So he goes to the lesser of two evils. And there's this kingside attack finally, but with too li too little too late, and I just start trading pieces off. Aha! Your your rooks are traded. Now, if if it weren't for the pin, uh, Black would have mate and one, but uh, I've got him pinned. I had that covered, so king g5, and I just trade off. I'm happy to trade off, and a4. Uh, he realizes this game is over. He's going to lose it, and he thanked me for the game, and I thanked him as well. Well, uh, two games there. I will hopefully learn something there. Uh, you saw a lot of ideas and themes. Uh, and But I guess the main thing is I managed to win both those games with a minimal, minimal amount of opening preparation. I didn't know those lines that well at all, but I knew how to play them. I knew how to play the positions that came from them. So... Suppose I'd spent 40 hours preparing for those openings instead of uh, sharpening up my positional understanding. Uh, the, eventually, I'm going to run out of book and my knowledge, and I'm not going to know what to do. So you, you need to know what to do in the various positions. And now you've got a couple more ideas here from the white side and the black side of how to handle the King's Indian defense if you either play it or have it played against you. So. There's a lot of information. There's going to be a lot of these lessons. Uh, they're going to come once a week. And I uh, look forward to sharing something with, different with you next time. Once again, thanks for your time. See you soon.